everybody. I'm Luna. Welcome back to Luna. Oi. The world is a very scary place right now, and a lot of you are thinking about standing up for radical change. I get comments and messages from my audience every day who watch my videos because they want to learn more about my country, Vietnam. Our history and how we were able to defeat the brutal oppression of colonial France and imperialist United States of America. Because right now, a lot of you are suffering from brutal oppression all around the world. Well, I believe that the key to our success is the key to any successful revolution is ideology. Ho Chi Minh once said, "Action without ideology is blind action. Ideology without action is dogmatism." If we want a movement, a revolution to succeed, action and ideology must go along together. Ideology will guide actions, and actions will make ideology come true. Actually, there's one more important part to this, which American has talked about in some videos before: investigation. So, if you're trying to think about how to change the world for the better, it's not a bad idea to investigate successful revolutions of the past, like the revolution we had here in Vietnam. To make it easier for you to understand the ideology that guided our revolution in Vietnam, I've decided to do the unthinkable. I order all of my college textbooks on Marxism-Leninism and Ho Chi Minh thought, and I'm studying them all again. Something I really thought I would never do, because these books are boring as fuck. At least they were for me when I was a college student. Back then, honestly, I never thought I would need any of this knowledge ever in my life. I thought I would just be a normal girl with an office job for the rest of my life. But the world has gotten so scary so fast. Now I know that this knowledge is very important, and I'm glad I got to study Marxist and Leninist and Ho Chi Minh ideology so deeply as a student. So I'm going to share this knowledge with you now, but I will try to make it much less boring than my college classes were. I was born and raised as a Marxist-Leninist. In Vietnam, we studied Marxist-Leninism and Ho Chi Minh taught from primary school all the way through college. I have always known that Marxism and Leninism helped my country fight against imperialism and colonialism and gain our own independence. But I never realized how little the rest of the world knows about Marxism-Leninism until I started this channel and started talking to my audience about it. I know that there are a lot of misconceptions about Marxism-Leninism, and I also know a lot of Black Lives Matter activists are starting to discuss whether Marxism and Leninism could be helpful for your movement. I have seen a lot of people, mostly liberals, but also a lot of leftists, say that Marxism is just for white people, and that Marx and Engels and Lenin were just a bunch of white dead guys, and that communism has nothing to do with black people or people of color. First of all, not all Marxists are white, and actually, the number of white Marxists today is way lower than the number of Marxists who are people of color, like myself. Ho Chi Minh, Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, Patrice Lumumba, Mao Zedong—they were some of the most important Marxist Leninists in history, and none of them were white. Today, millions and millions of people of color around the world are Marxist Leninists, and many people, such as in the Philippines, are fighting Marxist Leninist revolutions right now. So please, don't erase us by saying that communism is only for white people. For me, the main goal of Marxism is to make people equal, to liberate all human beings. This ideology helps oppressed people realize the nature of capitalism and show us that a better society is possible. For over a hundred years. Marxism has been tested all over the world. Many times, communism has almost been wiped out by capitalism. But to this day, Marxism still exists, and lately, it's been growing more and more popular. Even though capitalism has spent so much money and so many resources trying to wipe us out. For example, in the USA, capitalism is what gives the white supremacism and transphobia and all other forms of bigotry their power. It's the capitalist state that uses bigotry to divide the working class, and it's the capitalist state that allows racists and bigots to have so much power in American society. It's true, we cannot fight capitalism alone. We have to fight capitalism and systemic racism and other forms of bigotry together. But we will never be able to have an equal society until we defeat capitalism. Capitalists want to suppress Marxism because they know that these ideas are the biggest threat to their power structures. 
That's why I believe it's now necessary for all people around the world to seriously consider Marxism. I do personally believe that Marxism-Leninism can liberate the black community and all communities, not just in the USA, but all around the world. But you cannot just copy exactly what Lenin did. You can't even copy what Ho Chi Minh did. Lenin and Ho Chi Minh both tailor Marxist philosophy for the material conditions of the time and place in which they lived. So, in order to make ideology useful, you have to learn how to use Marxist ideology creatively to apply our principles to your current material conditions. And these books actually do a great job teaching us how to do it. They were written by Vietnam's Ministry of Education. Basically, Vietnam's education system wanted to take information from a lot of different sources, such as Marx's uh, Das Capital, and Lenin's writings, and Ho Chi Minh's writings, and streamline them all together into one curriculum which students could easily learn. And I have to admit, these books break things down in a way that is very simple and easy to understand. As far as I know, nobody has ever translated the text into English. So, this might be the first time this info has ever been shared outside of Vietnam. I would like to eventually translate them fully into English. So, if that's something you would be interested in, let me know in the comments. Maybe I can do a GoFundMe or something to try to translate them all. Follow me on Twitter or consider becoming my patron if you're interested in that. I will put the links in the description. But for now, I want to make the basic info available as quickly as possible, so I will make some videos that share the information as simply and entertainingly as possible, so it might help my comrades around the world. So let's crack these babies open and have some fun with communist ideology. Now let's start with chapter 1, Introduction to the Basic Principles of Marxism-Leninism. Generally speaking, Marxism-Leninism is a system of ideas and scientific theories built by Marx and Engels and developed by Lenin. Marxism-Leninism is a philosophy that explains the dynamic laws of nature, society, and human thought. I will talk more about this dynamic law later in this video, but for now I can say this. Nature, society, and human thought always change, always move and develop. For thousands of years, Europeans tried to learn and explain this through philosophy. But there were some major limitations in those early ideas. Marx, Engels, and Lenin tried to create a new ideology to scientifically tackle all the problems with re-existing European philosophy. Studying the development of human society is one of the most important purposes of Marxism. At the time Marx and Engels were alive, capitalism was getting stronger and stronger all over the world. They saw how the working class was exploited. They saw how the workers started to fight for their basic rights. And they saw the evil nature of capitalism. By the 1840s, the contradictions between the working class and the capitalist class in Europe has become really serious. There were a lot of workers' strikes and revolutions all over Europe. At that time, Marx, as a supporter for working class, knew that a revolution can only succeed it if it has a clear ideology that is suitable with reality. This is why Marx and Engels developed their ideas. But it's also a fact that Marx and Engels did not create Marxism out of thin air. There were a lot of other people who inspired Marx and Engels. First, there were Hegel and Feuerbach. They were both German philosophers and famous for their German classic philosophy. One of Hegel's biggest achievements was his critique of the metaphysical method. This model was based on dialectics. The dialectical method is an ancient form of discourse based on two or more people holding different points of view trying to establish the truth through by arguing. It's kind of like debate. In Europe, dialectics go back to ancient times when Socrates and Plato and Aristotle wrote philosophical texts in the form of arguments between different characters. Dialectics were also used in ancient Asia. Taoism is an ancient philosophy that presents the world as made up of opposites in conflicts with each other. For thousands of years, philosophers in Asia have used dialectical logic to examine the human experience. It's interesting to note that Asian Marxist-Leninists like Mao Zedong and Ho Chi Minh blended Asian dialectical principles into Marxist-Leninism, but that's a topic for another time. For now, you should just understand that dialectics just means uh, trying to find the truth by arguing from different sides. Hegel developed dialectics to form clear arguments with a scientific system of laws and categories. 
but Hegel was an idealist. That means Hegel believed that the world experience is not the real world, because we experience it in our thoughts and in our own minds. We are only able to see and hear and touch an ideal world, not the real physical world. So, Hegel and other idealists believed that the best way to discuss and try to understand the world was through the self-conscious mind. Basically, Hegel was more concerned with trying to find truth through uh, thought than through trying to look at the physical world. This is why Hegel developed his system of dialectics to try to find the best ways to argue and understand about the world from an idealist perspective. Now, let's look at Feuerbach another German philosopher who influenced Marx and Engels. Feuerbach moved Hegel's dialectical method from the idealistic view to the materialistic view. Materialism is the opposite of idealism. Materialists believe that it is possible to measure, observe, and understand our physical world through uh, provable scientific methods, and that materialism is the best way to understand our world. So, Feuerbach took the dialectical method of Hegel and applied it to material analysis. Marx and Engels were heavily influenced by Feuerbach, but they believed that he was inconsistent with materialism. Sometimes, he would present arguments idealistically, and sometimes he would use materialism. So, they took the ideas of Hegel and Feuerbach and developed them to create their system of understanding the world, which we call dialectical materialism. So, in order to understand Marxism and Leninism, you have to learn how to examine the world with dialectical materialism. That means, you need to be able to dialectically argue about the world from a materialist perspective. Wow, that still sounds complicated, doesn't it? But you know, it's interesting. I think it's easier to understand in Vietnamese. In Vietnamese, we call dialectical materialism chủ nghĩa duy vật biện chứng. Biện chứng is dialecticals, and it means arguing according to evidence. I think the Vietnamese version will help you understand the difference between Hegel's dialectical idealism and Marx's dialectical materialism, because Marx and Engels believe in using provable material evidence to argue dialectically. That's very important for understanding dialectical materialist thinking. For now, just remember, Dialectical materialism is all about understanding the world by forming arguments which are based on evidence which we get from the real world. Does that make sense? I hope so. Now let's talk about Adam Smith and David Ricardo. Smith and Ricardo also influenced Marx and Engels with their concepts of profit and political economics. They helped Marx and Engels understand the concepts of value and profit the importance of material production and the economic rules which bring all these ideas together. But Adam Smith and David Ricardo could not distinguish between symbol production and capitalist production. They figured out some of the basic principles of production but didn't really understand the nature of capitalism. So Marx and Engels applied dialectical materialism to the science of economics to understand the true nature of capitalism. Marx and Engels also learned a lot from St. Simon, Charles Fourier, and Robert Owen, who were all utopianists. Utopianists saw that the early industrial working class was very miserable. They lived under terrible conditions, and utopianists believed that a better world could be built. For instance, Robert Owen was a wealthy textile manufacturer who tried to build a better society in New Harmony, Indiana, in the USA. Owen purchased the entire town in 1825 to try and build an ideal society. They believed they could create a new moral world of happiness, enlightenment, and prosperity through education, science, technology, and communal living. Owen's vision failed after two years for a variety of reasons, and a lot of other rich capitalists in the early 19th century had similar plans which also failed. So, utopianism did a good job at criticizing capitalism by exposing the miserable situations of poor workers and offering a vision of a better society. But, utopianism was not scientifically, materialistically grounded. So, utopianists were not ideologically prepared to replace capitalism. Utopianists did not understand how capitalism developed and the role of the working class in revolution. And this is why, according to Marx and Engels, they failed. So, Marx and Engels developed an ideology to overcome all these different shortcomings. 
Marxism predicts that capitalism, which is so terribly flawed, is not the end goal and could never be the end goal of human society. Marx and Engels argue that communism is the true end goal that we should strive towards. Communist society is a society that is stateless, classless, and everybody is equal and there is no exploitation. No class is more important or powerful than any other class, and no race is superior to any other race. So, Marxism is the science of moving society away from capitalism and towards communism. This science was developed using dialectical materialism. So now that you understand the historical background and the philosophers that influenced Marx and Engels, let's start to really try to understand dialectical materialism. We already explained that dialectical materialism is making arguments based on material evidence. But how does it actually work? How do you apply dialectical materialism to problems? This is something we study in Vietnam from childhood. It's a key part of our curriculum in school, just like history and math and language. Once you learn dialectical materialism, you will start seeing the world in a different way. In fact, I will admit it, sometimes it's frustrating when I try to have discussions with people from the USA and Europe who don't study dialectical materialism because it feels like we are looking at the world in a completely different ways. I really think dialectical materialism can help us understand the world and each other. So, let's learn how to think dialectically. To understand how dialectical materialism works, you have to understand what is matter, what is consciousness, and what is the relationship between the two. First, what is matter? Well, the philosophical definition of matter is different from the definition of matter used in hard sciences like physics and chemistry. According to Lennon, matter is a philosophical category denoting objective reality, which is given to man in his sensations and which is copied photographed, and reflected by our sensations, while existing independently of them. Under this philosophical viewpoint, the most common attribute of all forms of matter is objective existence. It means matter always exists no matter what, whether humans recognize it or not. If I measure a rock and it weighs 1 kilogram, it will still weigh 1 kilogram when you measure it. We can't argue about that. It's just a fact. It doesn't change based on my opinion or your opinion. Matter is objective. Matter can affect humans' feelings. If I pick up that one kilogram rock and throw it in your hand, you will probably feel some emotions about that. So, materialists argue that human ideas are just a reflection of the outside material world inside our minds. An important concept in dialectical materialism is that matter is constantly changing. Matter is defined by motion. All matter that has ever been observed is in a state of motion and changes over time. Even a rock that seems to be motionless is actually moving and changing. The molecules inside a rock are moving, and the rock is on Earth, which is spinning and moving through space. Millions of years ago, the rock was molten lava, and in a billion years, the rock wouldn't look like it does now. It will continue to change, even if right now that change is so slow that it's imperceivable. Okay, so now we understand matter. So let's find out, what is consciousness? Consciousness or ideas is the way we see the world and understand the world. Consciousness is the version of the world inside your mind. The world that you think you know is just a reflection of the real world that we are living in. Imagine this, your eyes and your sensations work as a projector. It records the matter world, then sends the images, the information into your brain, And based on those images and information, your brain builds consciousness about the world. The reflection of the world varies in each person's mind. For example, for people who were born blind or deaf, their consciousness about the world is very different from people who don't have the same conditions. Blind people can't see, so their world has no color. Deaf people can't hear, so their world doesn't have a sound. So it means even though we share one same material world, each of us have a different consciousness about the world. So what creates consciousness? Marx and Engels argued for the social origin of consciousness. Marx believed that consciousness emerged from social activities, specifically language and labor. Basically, Marx believed that we develop consciousness from interacting with each other and from interacting with our environment. Language evolved for humans to exchange thoughts, and our thoughts are rooted in language. So, language was an important development for human consciousness. Labor was also an important development for human consciousness. 
Marx defines labor as the process by which humans impact the material world and change it. When we make products or build buildings or do anything to improve our lives by interacting with the material world, we are performing labor. Labor changes the human body and also changes the material world around us. For example, thousands of years ago, a group of humans in Africa found an edible kind of grass. They wanted to have more, so they planted the seeds from that grass. That was how rice made. And now, rice is the most essential food in the world. Over many, many years, humans train our physical activity to become rice growers. And the physical conditions of growing rice changed our mind and the ways we think about the world. Labor helps humans build muscle. It makes us stronger. Labor helps us change a piece of white land into a farm to grow food. And from that labor, humans have knowledge about how to grow food, like rice, and share that knowledge widely with other people. That is how consciousness is built. So, consciousness comes from interaction with other human beings and with our environment. Now we understand matter and we understand consciousness. So, what's the relationship between the two? Well, matter and consciousness have a dialectical relationship. What? What the hell is dialectical relationship? Well, now we are finally getting ready to learn about how to see the world through the lens of dialectical materialism. Dialectical relationships are relationships where things mutually impact each other. According to dialectical materialism, all motion and all change is the result of dialectical relationships. Everything is constantly being affected by and affecting things at the same time. If one car crashes into another car, that's a dialectical relationship. If I drop a brick on the ground from the top of a building, the brick will leave an impression on the ground, and the brick will also be broken by the ground. Mutual impact, dialectical relationship. So it is very important for you to understand that matter and consciousness have a dialectical relationship. Matter defines consciousness, and consciousness can impact matter through human activity. Let me explain how matter defines consciousness. As you know, the real world has been existing for billions of years, and humans just came to exist on this world about 200,000 years ago. So it's obvious that matter appeared first, and human consciousness appeared much later. I said earlier in this video that consciousness is the reflection of the real world inside human mind. So it means when matter changes, consciousness also changes accordingly. For example, you're driving on a highway, suddenly you see a big rock in the middle of the road. What do you do? Well, if you don't want to have an accident, you have to turn the steering wheel to avoid that rock, right? So in this example, the rock, the matter, appears and it changes your consciousness, your thoughts when you were driving. But does that mean consciousness cannot change matter at all? Well, for one thing, your thoughts are what tell your hands to turn the steering wheel to change the direction of the car. So obviously, thoughts can affect the material world. In many Hollywood superhero movies such as X-Men or Superman, some people can move things just by using their thoughts. But, unluckily, I don't have magic or superpower, so I cannot move this bottle from my right hand to my left hand just by my thought, no matter how long I look at it. Move. Move. But if I order my left hand to grab the bottle from my right hand with my thoughts, voila, now I have what I wanted. Okay, so what does that mean? It means thoughts cannot directly change matter, but it can impact matter by human activities. Because matter defines our ideas, so the most important rule of dialectical materialism is this. In order to succeed, all human ideas and activities should be based on material reality. Marx used the term material conditions to describe all the material things and processes around us. So when Marx talks about material conditions, he's just talking about the real world that we are living in. For example, I want to own my own house, but I don't have enough money to buy a house. So based on my material conditions of not having any money, I can't buy a house. If I want to own a house, I will have to make a plan that is based on my current material conditions. A plan of making more money that is realistic, that makes sense for the environment I live in. Or I will have to give up my dream of owning a house and come up with a new dream that matches my current material conditions, like uh, buying a house in the seams. Another example of basing our actions and strategies on our material conditions is Vietnam in 1945. At that time, our Communist Party wanted to have a communist revolution. 
But Ho Chi Minh knew that many Vietnamese people could not have a time and energy to learn what Marxism was to support this revolution because millions of us were starving to death. Seriously, when you don't even know whether you're gonna have food to eat tonight or not, will you want to spend time on learning about someone's ideology? Based on that fact, Ho Chi Minh decided that the very first plan for the revolution was to get people food. And we did it! They attacked the stores of the Japanese armies, stole rice, and distributed it to poor people. Millions of starving people at that time suddenly saw that communism gave them food, so they decided to follow communism without even knowing what it actually meant. That is just one small example about how our revolution succeed. Remember this, all your decisions, plans, or strategies have to correspond with the material conditions, the reality. Such as now we can see that in many countries in the world, people are dying because of COVID-19 and racism and police brutality. So we as revolutionists, what do we do? How can we persuade more people to join our ideology than fight with us for our revolution? It's obvious that we have to help them solve their problems first so they can see, wow, these people really helped me. They really understood my material conditions. So I guess I will support the revolution now. That's how we get people to our side, who we care about what Marxism actually means when they are coughing to death or being shot and beaten to death by police and white supremacists. We, Marxists and Leninists, have to prove to them that we are on their side by our own actions, real effective actions. Let's do things step by step, from easy targets to more difficult targets like Vietnam did. First, we stole rice to feed people. Second, we stole weapons to arm people. Third, we shut down the factories to paralyze the production system of our enemies. And then the real revolution started. That's a simplification, of course, but it shows the pattern of building a plan and proceeding based on material conditions. Alright, we all now have basic ideas about dialectical materialism. There's another important question. How to apply dialectical materialism in daily life? The way we apply dialectical materialism in real life is called materialist dialectics. Materialist dialectics, in a very simple definition, means having arguments and judgments based on facts. To use this materialist dialectics in real life, there are two principles that we have to remember. The first principle is understanding things from a comprehensive viewpoint. Lenin said, if we want to really understand a thing, we need to see the whole of it. Examine the whole of it and all the direct and indirect connections that it has with other objects, phenomena, or process. It means when we try to understand a thing, we have to comprehensively see it in all aspects. The more complicated the thing is, the more aspects you have to investigate. For example, you're looking at this bottle of drink. Can you tell if the water inside is sweet or salty by just looking at it without any labels or brand names? No, you can't. You have to investigate first. I will investigate now by having a taste of it. Then I will have the right answer. Uh, I hope that my investigation doesn't conclude that this is poison. Well, here goes. <sighs> well, it's actually sweet and a little bit sunny. And so far as at least, it doesn't seem to be poisonous. So you see, we can't have the right answer about the taste of the water inside this bottle until we actually drink it or until someone you trust who actually tasted it tells you the answer, like what I just did. Hi, I'm American Johnson, Luna's comrade, here to share with you a story about investigation and why it matters for you and for me. So when I was a kid, my dad liked to drink beer a lot and we would go on road trips and he would pour beer into like a soda can and then I would be a little kid in the back seat and I would be thirsty and I would grab the coke can and I'd say oh boy I'm gonna drink this coca cola now and I'd start drinking it and then realize that it was beer and my child's tongue rejected it in disgust and I spit it out and I said dad why did you put beer in this coke can and he said so the police don't see me drinking a beer while I'm driving don't do this, by the way. This is very illegal and irresponsible. <laughs> but that's what my dad did back in the 90s. And uh, it was an important lesson to me that we should always 
investigate things. I should have at least done a sniff test of the Coca-Cola before drinking. So the moral of this story, besides don't drink and drive, which you should never do, is don't just trust appearances. Investigate fully and deeply from every angle. And don't judge a book dialectically by its cover alone. And by book, I mean beverage. And by cover, I mean can. Because you never know when your dad is drinking and driving and he poured a beer into a Coke can. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there were five blind fortune tellers. They were all friends. And one day, they heard that a circus is coming to their town and they bring an elephant. All five fortune tellers are very excited because all of them never met an elephant before. So when the circus came, they gave the guy who takes care of the elephant some money and he will allow them to touch the elephant. The first fortune teller touches the nose, the second one touches the ivory, the third one touches the leg, the fourth one touches the ear, and the last one touches the tail. After touching really carefully, they all came up with their conclusion. The first fortune teller said, Eh, I thought the elephant was very special but it's just like a big leech. The second one said, I don't think it's like a leech at all, I think it's like a big hard wooden stick. The third one said, No, no, it feels like a big hand fan. The fourth one, You're all wrong. I touch it and it feels exactly like a wooden column. The last fortune teller said, All four of you are wrong. I felt one side which is very furry. It's exactly like a broom. All five fortune tellers don't agree with each other because each of them have their own evidence that they believe. Then they argue and beat each other up. The end of the story. So what's the lesson from this story? The lesson is, before making any conclusion or judgment, we have to check and see all the aspects of a thing or a problem. Lack of knowledge will bring divine thoughts and wrong conclusions. And to me, there's also another lesson. There are always people who don't know what they are talking about, but always act like they know the best. Don't be one of them, okay? Seeing things comprehensively is very important, but it is not enough. We also have to see and investigate their whole developing process in different points of time. This is called historical viewpoint, and it is the second principle of materialist dialectics. As I mentioned earlier, everything always changes and develops. That's why when we learn about anything, we have to also learn and understand their processes of development. For example, I am looking at this beautiful flower, but is it always a flower like this? Nope. It was a seed, then it became a sapling, then a full plant, then a flower as now. It will die and decay in the future. Understanding the whole development of this flower makes me respect its beauty more, makes me value it more. In my next video, we will talk more about this changing process, which Max defines using qualities and quantities. But I think that's too complicated to cover in this introductory video. If you're really interested and can't wait for part 2, I will link to a video in the description which Ize already did on this subject. Now, let me tell you a true story. It's about my comrade, American Johnson, the guy whose dad drinks beer on road trips. 10 years ago, he was a right-wing libertarian and a filthy capitalist. Sorry, Jay. Now, he's an anarchal communist, a true comrade. So, is he good or bad? You can't have the right answer because in this point of time, he's a good comrade, but in his past, he was a dirty, dirty capitalist. So, instead of essentializing him into one simple conclusion, we have to see EJ as a whole developing process. Essentializing him or anybody is meaningless, and you can't learn anything from other people if you do that. By looking at the changing of his life, we can learn from good decisions that he made, such as why and how he became a leftist. And we also can learn from his mistakes and bad decisions, such as why he fell into libertarian ideology and why he was a capitalist for 10 years. These two principles are very important in real life. If we look at them as a chart, the comprehensive viewpoint will be the Y line and the historical viewpoint will be the X line. The X line shows the timeline of the development, the Y line shows the different aspects. If you connect every aspect with every point of time, you can draw a diagram of the development of a thing. So instead of seeing a thing as just a dot like this, now you see the whole of its diagram. Isn't that cool? Materialist dialectics help you have a deeper look, a deeper understanding of everything, especially human. 
and time after time, it will become your mindset that makes you always want to investigate before giving any conclusion or judgment. And I believe it would help you avoid a lot of mistakes in real life and also help you avoid many shitty takes on Twitter. Seriously, every day I see so many hot takes from online people, especially content creators who try to act like they know the best. And when people try to reason with them, they dismiss all the arguments and think everybody is stupid. I do believe that you need to be really ignorant to think you know better than everyone else. So, in summary, the materialist dialectics is a method of reflecting the real world in humans' minds. The most basic law of this method is to understand things in their relationship with other things, in their own movement and development. And we also have to check and view all aspects of a thing before making any conclusion or judgment about that thing. This method of thinking is very very important for all of us, especially leftists. It helps us avoid meaningless arguments such as, was Stalin good or bad? Was Mao good or bad? Was Marx racist or not racist? To me, it's just a waste of time if we fall into this kind of argument. A person could be good in this aspect, but be bad in other aspects. A person could be wrong in this part of his life, but also right in other parts of his life. Marx was racist against Mexicans and black people. EJ made a really good video about this topic in his channel. I was also in that video talking about Marx and Ho Chi Minh. If you want to learn more about it, the link is in the description. To me, the fact that Marx was racist doesn't affect the value of Marxism at all. Marxism is not a racist ideology. In fact, Marxism helps free oppressed people of all races and build a better society for everyone. Another example that I want to mention is Stalin. He had many wrong decisions in his life, but we also have to appreciate what he did to help the USSR such as fighting the Nazi in the 30s and the 40s. The USSR was instrumental to the victory of the world against fascism. You can't deny the role of Stalin in that victory. Now, I know that many people had called me Stalin apologist for saying that. Well, let me tell you this, I am not. And after this lesson about didactical materialism, I hope that you will change your mind about that. I don't agree with people who said Stalin was bad and we shouldn't care or learn about him. Because he actually made the USSR strong militarily and helped the world defeat fascism. I also don't agree with people who believe Stalin did nothing wrong, because it's so obvious that he did many things wrong, including cheating Ho Chi Minh badly. He thought Ho Chi Minh was a spy from a capitalist country and didn't believe Vietnam could win against France. And Stalin refused to support Vietnam, which obviously pisses me off. But that doesn't mean I want to waste all my time arguing about whether Stalin was essentially good or essentially bad. What a waste of time. Speaking of Ho Chi Minh, the great leader of Vietnam, he also made mistakes. In my opinion, his most serious mistake was the land reforms in the 50s. My family members were victims, so I do know about that very well. In the early of 1950s, the north of Vietnam wanted to build a communist society while we were fighting against France. Ho Chi Minh wanted to redistribute the farmland so everyone would have their own farm, their own means of production. My family was super rich back then. We were landlords for maybe a hundred of years, and we owned shit lot of land. The communists in my grandparents' village implemented that order in a horrible way. They took everything from my grandparents, even the shirt on my grandma's body. They tortured my grandpa for days in the big yard of the village. All the peasants who worked for my grandparents took the chance to get revenge too. It was a very traumatizing memory for both of my grandparents. So in 1956, Ho Chi Minh realized what he did wrong and immediately fixed it. In our national assembly in the same year, he cried and apologized to the whole nation. My family understood that his original order was not that brutal. Ho Chi Minh just wanted to take the land of rich people and give it to poor people so everybody could have equal divisions of land. But he didn't predict that the local communists and local peasants would take everything and even torture those rich people. Ho Chi Minh found out what was happening. He immediately asked for the release of all people under arrest or being tortured and gave the house and a piece of land back to my family. Now, many of my family members are communists and even work for the local government. That said, the mistake Ho Chi Minh made doesn't affect the value of Ho Chi Minh taught, and it doesn't dismiss all the sacrifice he made for Vietnam. Vietnamese people still love him and respect him as a human, but Ho Chi Minh is not a symbol of perfection, no one is. Some people say that because Marx was sexist, 
Marxism must be sexist. We are in our very first democratic election in 1945. Ho Chi Minh, a Marxist, immediately puts the idea that women should be allowed to vote. There was no question, no argument against that at all. And since then, Vietnamese women always have had rights to vote. Well, if it's true, then it doesn't mean all Marxists are sexist. Ho Chi Minh did exactly what dialectical materialism taught him to do. Learn the good and avoid the bad. Dialectical materialism helps us avoid useless arguments and focus on finding the best solutions for the problems we are coping with. We learn from good ideas and also learn from mistakes that we and other people make. Dialectical materialism helps us build a better version of ourselves. I admit, it's hard to learn at first, but once you have it in your mind, you will have a different view about this world. So instead of being angry and annoyed with people we don't agree with, now we are willing to talk to them in good faith, and maybe we will learn that they are right and we are wrong, who knows? At least we can always learn something from other people, right? Alright, I hope that this video was not boring to you. I try my best to make it as accessible as possible. This is really just the beginning. There's a lot more you need to learn to fully understand dialectical materialism and Marxist-Leninism. So, I will make a lot more videos in this series and we can learn together step by step. So, stay tuned! Thank you for watching and be sure to subscribe. See you next week. Bye-bye!